Hi class, so this week we will begin chapter two or part two, media and processes from your book. And in this section, we'll be looking at various ways to make art through, the, through media and processes. Um, now that we've really covered the basics, looking at the elements and principles of art, we get to the fun part of actually looking at the different ways that media is made. But don't completely forget everything we've looked at in the first part because we will really utilize the elements and principles as we talk about the various media. So in this chapter, we will look at the different ways in which artists express their ideas. Everything from the most traditional forms of drawing and painting all the way through photography and film. Um, now we'll cover very little of the end of this part due to the lack of time, but I will incorporate some film into our discussion of photography. Um, but looking back at everything else, each of these various styles could easily consume a semester or more of classes. But for this introduction to visual arts, we will unfortunately just have to hit some of the highlights of each of the various media. So rather than covering several sections at once because there is so much information, I've really created videos for each section on its own, with the exception of we'll see sculpture and architecture put together and then photography and film as well. So but this week we're going to start with 2.1 drawing. So what is drawing? I think we can probably all identify a drawing and drawing is actually defined as the depiction of shapes and forms created by lines on a surface. This is the most basic skill learned by artists and not only artists draw, um, think of all the drawings you did as a child and brought home to your parents who probably had them on the refrigerator forever. Um, and even children often draw before they can, they draw to communicate before they can talk. So there's lots of reasons that we draw. Um, artists use drawing to define their ideas. They may create a sketch, which basically is a rough preliminary version of a work or a part of a work to really help them plan things out. And what we see here with um, Jacques-Louis David's Oath of the Horatia, which we'll look at the painting a little bit more later, but you'll notice here that David is, has used in one of his sketches to kind of work out and made some changes once he move, moves into the completed paint or the finished painting. Um, you'll notice the background's a little different, particularly the women on the right are a little different as far as their the way that they're interacting with one another. He simplified the design much more when he moves from sketches to painting. So again, a really good way to sort of work out their ideas and to help plan out a finished product. Artists use uh, drawing as notations of something seen, something remembered or imagined to kind of help them keep it in mind. Um, they wake up, remember part of a dream, quickly sketch it out. Um, and this type of connotation has much more private, sort of personal sketchbook feel to it. Um, drawing can also be used as a finished product all on its own. And we'll look at some of those as well. Uh, drawing is a very accessible medium, meaning you don't need a lot of equipment to do it. So it is one of those things that pretty much anyone can do. You've had, you usually have to write with a pencil at some point. You can use pencil, pen, markers, crayons, whatever. It's very, very accessible. So we're actually going to start with someone who is a prolific drawer, Leonardo da Vinci. Um, da Vinci sketchbooks are very well known. You can look them up and flip through them online just about anywhere, so, but we are going to look at a few pages from them. And so da Vinci wondered if humans could fly. So here he has this illustration of a flying machine, which really communicates efficiently this idea. Um, and he was a prolific sketcher. He drew things out repeatedly and worked out lots of problems, um, worked out forms and things as he goes through. He also did a huge amount of drawings of human anatomy. Um, he had no medical training, and yet he did these dissections and really acquired knowledge of the workings of the human body very far in advance of the medical profession professionals of his day. Now, some of these he did actually 
um, acquire cadavers and cut into them in order to be able to draw the human form correctly. Um, he worked with a number of models, both dead and alive, and um, really worked out the proportions of the human body, the form, the way that our skeletal structure really holds up our skin. And that's one of the reasons he was very good at capturing this, the muscular of the human form. Um, he actually claimed by the end of his life to cut up more than about 30 corpses, I believe. And so in the winter of a, between 1510 and 1511, he actually compiled a series of 10 sheets with more than 2,000 small drawings and over 13,000 words of notes. Um, he was the first person to depict the human spine accurately. And he then used these all to enhance his portrayals of the exterior of the human body. Now, the church wasn't super thrilled of all of this because they considered it a desecration of the body, but he tended to get away with it because we've, we've seen even the Sistine Chapel, his work working for the church, um, and they tended to kind of maybe look the other way, either because of his, they were looking to his sketches for evidence of the human soul even. So while he wasn't doing something that was necessarily approved by the church, he was kind of in his own way helping them as well. And again, because of his talent um, and because he was such a prolific artist, they tended to kind of look the other way a little bit when he did some questionable things. So um, this kind of just gives us a little bit of an intro into drawing. Um, and we're going to start with dry media. Um, and this includes things like silver point, pencils, and charcoal. So this is something that would just be no liquid needed. Um, it doesn't take time to dry, that kind of thing. And I know I keep using the words medium and media. And if you're not familiar with it, that's basically just referring to the material the artist uses to create art. Media is the plural of medium. So um, just so, so we're all on the same page. So your book talks about silver point, but in the late 15, early 16th centuries in Italy, metal point was very common. Um, it's not just silver point. Gold, silver, other metals were applied to either paper or wood that was primed with a thin coating of bone ash and this created a chemical reaction that allowed a mark to be left behind by the point. So when we say silver point, we're really talking about something that is a piece of wire set in a holder to make the wire easier to hold and control, but the wire is used as the drawing implement. Um, silver is much harder than graphite, so artists could make really detailed drawings. Um, it also meant the line was very pale and delicate and it really couldn't be in, couldn't be widened if you increase pressure, which we'll see you can do with with graphite and um, charcoal and things like that that we'll look at next. But so we have these very thin, delicate lines. Um, and artists, if they wanted a thicker line with silver point, had to switch to a thicker wire. So. Um, sometimes the stylist would have, or stylus, or what the um, the wire that they were working on, or the the thing that held the wire they were using, would have a really thin point on one end and a thicker point on the other end, so they could kind of switch back and forth easily. Now, silver tarnishes over time, so the pieces of silver that have been left behind by silver point really become darker and more pronounced as they aged. So. This work from of Raphael's from the 1500s would have been much lighter when it was first drawn. And this is the heads of the Virgin and Child. And you can see hatching here. Um, and remember, hatching is the parallel lines laid next to one another. There's not really any cross hatching going on. Um, this is a very light value. And so we see the head of the we see the head of the Virgin. We see lots of dark and shading detail with very close hatching to really give this depth to her features. And this is very sketchy, obviously. Um, now, one thing about silver point or metal point, 
Very few artists use it today because it's very unforgiving. You can't erase the mistakes. Um, it's not something that's easily to, easy to fix. Now, we have Filipino Lippi, um, his standing nude and seated man. Again, working out. This is kind of a working out of forms. Um, he drew these two figure studies with metal point on a pale pink background. And you notice here we do see cross hatching. There's these fine areas of hatching and cross hatching. Because remember, this is a very fine point, so there's no shading with this, particularly without using hatching or cross hatching. Um, likely, these would have been models in his workshop or his apprentices in his workshop modeling so he could work out kind of the human form and the human figure. So these would, again, kind of be not necessarily preliminary sketches, but more sort of a practice on getting the way that the folds of the drape of the fabric folds sit correctly and then also the forms of the human body. Now let's move on to graphite. Graphite is probably very familiar to everyone. Um, it is the most commonly medium used, commonly used medium for drawing. Um, you use it every test you've ever taken with a number two pencil, you, you have used graphite. So graphite was a crystalline form of carbon that was discovered in the 16th century. It's wonderful to draw with because it takes very little pressure to leave a mark. Now, near the end of the 18th century, a technique was discovered for binding powdered graphite with fine clay to make it into a stick. They then started encasing this in wood, and voila, we have pencils. So, an FYI, and an FYI pencil lead is not lead, but it's actually graphite. When graphite was discovered, it was actually thought to be a form of lead, and lead had actually been used as a writing implement since ancient times. So, but in this natural form, um, graphite is very brittle and soft, so it requires some form of casing. And also, by varying the percentage of clay in the graphite compound, you get a range of hardness. Um, the hardest has a lot of clay, the softest has very little clay. And so, it's really preferred because of its various hardness, so you can get different levels of value easy. It's also very forgiving. You can erase graphite. Um, and the types of graphite marks can be seen here in Picasso's portrait of Madame Patry. Um, this is one of a series of drawings he did while he was on his honeymoon of family and friends. And um, basically, as he and his new wife were staying with various family, friends, family and friends while they moved around on their honeymoon, he would often sketch people in return for, um, for staying with them. Well, if you notice how detailed he's able to get on her face using graphite. Now, this type of control from lights to darks is really one of the reasons graphite is so popular among artists. So you can layer it on without having to do this cross hatching. You can do shading with it. Um, and then we notice he really concentrates on her head and just sort of does these contour lines to really define her, the rest of her body and the chair that she is sitting in. So in your book is a diagram similar to this that shows the various shades available in graphite pencils and how, they, how their marks look. Um, they range from 9H, which is the hardest pencil with the most amount of clay making the lightest mark to 9B, which contains the most graphite and is the softest making a very dark mark. The number two pencil we all, again, have taken tests with um, and likely have for every standardized test you took from elementary on is in the mid range of color. It's, it actually corresponds on the chart as the HB color. So, um, if you're wondering how this works, again, there is a diagram kind of similar to this in your book um, that you can refer to. Okay, let's move on to another popular drawing medium, charcoal. Now, charcoal is the opposite extreme from graphite and from silver or metal point as well. It smudges easily, it's very soft compared to metal-based materials, and it leaves a very soft-edged line. So you probably used charcoal and not even realized it. 
Um, think about if you're sitting in front of a campfire and you have a half burned stick and you scratch on the rocks next to the campfire or scratch onto a tree and it leaves the black mark, you've used charcoal. Um, if metal point is concerned with delineation or showing individual marks, then charcoal and chalk and pastels themselves are all volumetric. They're very conducive to modeling through shading. What this means is you can kind of smudge them together and blend them to create the shading rather than having to draw individual lines. Um, charcoal is most often considered more expressive with very strong dark tones. It's much less linear. Um, vine charcoal is actually made from vine branches and it's very soft. Um, when you, you can buy ch vine charcoal in the store, you can draw with it. Um, and it tends to be very messy when you do. It just kind of crumbles as you draw with it. Um, compressed charcoal has a binding agent like wax and is much more dense. Now, it can even be sharpened to get a very thin line and it stays a little bit harder, but again, it's still much softer than graphite. Um, and because of its softness, erasers are even used as a tool to help kind of shade and smear along with it. And so drawing with charcoal and chalk really requires a paper with a tooth, something rough. It can't be overly smooth or the, med the media will just fall off of it. Um, today, artists use synthetic fixative or sprays over their finished works to help keep them from smudging. And this is Kathak Holowitz. And you can see in the face here where you can get this very soft modeling but then there's this burst of energy in her arm. This is her self-portrait. Um, and it, this is nice because it really does show us sort of a range of the medium. Um, we have these kind of carefully rendered effects on the face and then down to this smudginess down on the arm and very raw and dynamic. Now, I'm only gonna talk about this for a minute because you do have a video that you sh should watch after this. Um, and the Kentridge, the William Kentridge video will help you both, will help both further your understanding of charcoal as a medium. And it also shows why artists choose a certain medium for the message they're working to portray. Because Kentridge uses drawings to create animated films. Um, one drawing is actually used for multiple frames and he alters them through erase, erasing, ad adding things and redrawing. So, the first video that Kentridge is discussing his process and really shows how his films are made and it's only like three minutes or less and then the second is only about a minute and a half preview of one of his works and I really just want you to see these to kind of get an idea of how the medium of charcoal can be used in completely different ways than we normally think um, and this one shows a small part of one of his finished films and really shows what he's trying to communicate through his art um, he deals very, maybe not overtly, but in instances of one of the videos, very overtly with the political issues of his day. And some of these are done before the fall of our part, apartheid in South Africa and some of them afterward. Um, and he, his parents were very involved politically and he chose to use his art to be politically involved as well. So um, once you finish this video, then watch the Kendrick's video, Kendrick's video, and you'll understand that a little bit more as well. Okay, let's move on to pastel. Now, pastel is essentially a chalk medium with colored pigment and some non-greasy binder, um, such as gum arabic. And um, gum arabic is actually made from the hardened sap of, a, of specific acacia trees. And the binder is what actually makes the pigment stick to the surface to which it's being applied. Again, like with charcoal, you will need a, a piece of paper with a tooth to it or some kind of roughness to really capture the, the chalk and hold it. Um, and when we think of chalk pastel, we really think of Edgar Degas. Um, he was probably the most prof proficient and inventive user of the pastel medium and he really captured the effects of light um, through both the blending and the sketchiness of this medium. And I think you can see that here with our female in the bathtub 
or in this bathing tub. And you can see her back, it tends to blend, and then these very bright highlights, which are very much drawn in, sort of in a rough texture. Um, he really incorporates kind of the idea of a finished drawing with this very improvisational gestures. When I say improvisational gestures, I mean you can really see the marks on this. Um, and so it seems as if it was almost hurried. It's not something that he took the time to blend in afterward. He decided, oh, I need to add highlights here. And so he threw in a couple of marks. So when we talk about, you know, blended or finished versus improvisational, that's really what we're talking about, where you can really see the marks, where you can really see how he drew it on the page. Um, but Degas worked in a fixative formula that's been lost. So he really could build up different layers of pastel. And unfortunately, we don't really have his, his technique or the, the formula for what he used to keep his, his pastels fixed to the paper anymore. So there is also what's called Conte Crayon, C-O-N-T-E Crayon. And this is a heavily pigmented pastel combined with wax to make it into a crayon-like form. Um, it was named for the inventor Nicolas Jacques Conte, who was a French painter. And Conte is really used most often for making preliminary sketches. And this can be seen here in George Surratt's Trees on the Bank of the Seine. And this is a study for the painting we've seen several times, which is um, a Sunday afternoon on uh, the island of Le Grand Jatte. Um, here he really pushes this idea of light and dark tonal qualities that can be created with Conte Crayon. Um, you can see the deep, deep shadow along the right side of the tree in the front, um, along with the various mid-range tones that really make up the intertwining of the branches. And this is always an interesting sketch because this singular tree is, is always sort of a conundrum. Can you, is it very three-dimensional? Is it extremely flattened? It's kind of both if you really start looking at it. You see a lot of depth in the center part of the, um, the tree brain or the tree base and then this black strong outline on the far right basically just kind of flattens the whole thing so anyway but contact crown is really good for kind of getting a number of values and so again this makes it very popular because you're not having to switch out things like pencils and or switch from implementations to kind of get various values within within sort of this preliminary drawing idea. Okay, let's move on to liquid and wet media in drawing. Now, this, discuss, this discussion will also lead us into the next section with painting, but for the remaining of the discussion in drawing, we will look at types of ink. Now, ink can be applied with almost anything, but brushes and pens are most common. Um, they dry or harden as the liquid evaporates. And ink is really liked because it's permanent. We talk about the erasability of graphite and charcoal. Well, when we talk about ink, it's permanent. Which, again, think about going through elementary school. You were only allowed to use pencils because you had to be able to erase. And then once you get to high school, they really encourage you to use pen because they don't want you to erase. So, um, Kind of that same idea here between graphite charcoal and then ink used in art. And one artist you're probably really familiar with who readily used ink, which was we see here, is Rembrandt. And this is his cottage among the trees. Now, before the 19th century, artists would use reed pens from certain plants or quill pens from wing feathers of large birds to apply ink. Um, and Rembrandt was, again, a very prolific drawer. He made thousands of ink drawings in his lifetime. Um, many were preliminary drawings, but a lot of them were just merely for the pleasure of drawing. He would take his ink out and he would go draw. Um, there's various levels of detail in them. And ink is a very linear medium with quill and reed pens, which really controlled the flow of ink with a slit that was parallel to its shaft, which meant that they could get various lines depending on how wide this the, um, the slit was. 
Now, Van Gogh was someone else who really enjoyed working in ink, um, and he really controlled his pen strokes. Um, he would, he was very good at changing the width of his pens, um, and he worked in these short lines to create this really much, a big sense of, sense of energy within his work. And um, you can see here in his Sower with the Setting Sun, even though we don't have a lot of color, it's a very active drawing. And so he very, very much loved the idea of these very short lines, which are very reminiscent to the heavy impasto that is in his painting. And then there is Chinese drawing and painting with ink as well. Um, when we look at Chinese art, a lot of this is going to be much more drawing with ink and brush. Um, and ink is much more fluid when it's used with a brush. Everything we've looked at thus far has been very specific lines. Well, you notice there's much softer edges to the drawing here. Um, and this takes us into kind of a combination of both writing with a, with a pen and um, drawing with a brush. Um, drawing with a brush has a long tradition in the East and because the brush is actually used for writing as well. And Chinese calligraphy is very much considered a high art. And so like with calligraphy, ink drawings can be have the same long, elegant lines. And you can kind of see that here. Um, it's very economical. There's few lines and marks that make it very expressive. Um, each, each leaf, each branch was very delicately put on. And so this actually is a good transition into painting um, because we do sort of look at the idea of painting with ink and then we'll move on to paint as a medium itself.